The first atomic explosion seemed fascinating, extravagant, even amusing. The bikini bathing suit for women, daringly revealing for the time, was named after the Pacific Atoll that was home to the first nuclear test site. This is the official channel of the International Luxembourg Forum on Preventing Nuclear Catastrophe, with a three-part documentary, Why Do We Not Fear Nuclear War? It was only due to a stroke of luck and the strong nerves of certain national leaders that the world escaped weapons of mass destruction being used in anger during the Cold War. Back then, though, people feared nuclear war. Second World War veterans who understood the consequences of a nuclear exchange were still alive. Public opinion surveys now, though, show that that fear of weapons of mass destruction has gone. This attitude is clearly visible in the public space. Political figures and journalists boldly threaten enemies with a strike that would burn them to ashes, while military theorists publish studies proving that a nuclear war can be won and that a nuclear exchange does not necessarily end in universal catastrophe. Why has the general attitude changed so dramatically? Humanity accepted the creation of an atomic bomb quite calmly. The release of nuclear energy seemed to endorse a universal faith in progress. It seemed that history, like a well-trained army, was marching from its primitive past to a better, happier future. If the production of atomic weapons had been a heavy burden on taxpayers, the US might have shown more restraint in building its nuclear arsenal. But all that was needed was a modest initial investment in designing weapons and building enrichment facilities for uranium and plutonium. After that, nuclear bombs could be produced at a comparatively acceptable price. A few days after the nuclear bombardment of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the New York Times enthusiastically wrote, the atomic bomb was created for war, but the knowledge that made its creation possible was born due to immortal thirst for knowledge and the use of the gifts of nature for the common good. This new knowledge can bring to this earth not death but life, not tyranny and cruelty, but a divine freedom. A Gallup poll two weeks after the atomic bombs detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed that 85% of respondents favored using the atomic bomb, and only 1.7% opposed it. Public opinion was enthusiastically optimistic. The secret of the atom will bring prosperity and a more perfect life. It will open an era of unprecedented wealth and possibilities for all is what was written and said in the first years following World War II. Henry Louis Stimson, the US Secretary of War, promised President Franklin Roosevelt that the bomb will ensure the world order that would guarantee world peace and save civilization. The beginning of the atomic era coincided with the beginning of the American century. The United States perceived itself as a rich and successful country whose fate had been fortunately shaped almost throughout its short history. Americans believed that they were the world's strongest nation. The US economy became the general driver of the world economy. International recognition of the dollar as the world currency symbolized an era that might be called Pax Americana. The United States daringly launched grand and ambitious projects. Naturally, there were certain imperfections in the universe that worried Americans but they feared nothing, not even the threat of nuclear extermination. The United States was convinced that atomic weapons were a reliable guarantee of national security. However, on August 29, 1949, the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear weapon. The United States lost its invulnerability because now it might fall victim to a splitting atom. Arthur Vandenberg, chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, admitted now we are living in a different world. Britain too realized its vulnerability to Soviet nuclear weapons. The Joint Chiefs of Staff prepared a report on the shape of a future war, taking Hiroshima and Nagasaki into account. They realized that it would take just 30 nuclear bombs to annihilate Britain. On July 31, 1958, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev told the leader of communist China, Mao Zedong, now that we have intercontinental missiles, we have the United States by the throat. They think that the United States is beyond reach, but that is not so. When Nikita Khrushchev said, we will bury you, 
His threat was taken seriously and literally, and it terrified America. Parents and local politicians insisted that air defense sirens should be installed in schools, and adults and children attended civil defense training. However, more sober voices sounded pessimistically. Can any civil defense protect anyone when 6,000 nuclear warheads explode? The only choice is whether to die in the open air or to be roasted or boiled alive. It is impossible to defend against the number of warheads the USSR and the US have deployed against each other. Yet both US and Soviet militaries considered nuclear war a viable option and worked on the premise that victory was possible and continued to build their arsenals. In the late 1950s, China became a major irritant for the United States. Confrontation with the Soviet Union could be very acute, but actual war could break out between the US and the People's Republic of China. Nathan F. Twining, United States Air Force Chief of Staff, stated menacingly, I do not think that three small atomic bombs, if struck home, would lead into much trouble. Instead, they will teach the Chinese a good lesson. When informed by scientists about the genetic effects of nuclear radiation, General Tommy Powers, Strategic Air Command Commander-in-Chief, mockingly replied, you know, it's not yet been proved to me that two heads aren't better than one. General Powers did not like politicians saying that if it came to a real war, only military targets should be hit, while populated localities and civilians should be spared. Restraint, he protested. Why are you so concerned with saving their lives? The whole idea is to kill the bastards. At the end of the war, if there are two Americans and one Russian left alive, we win. In 1964, China also achieved nuclear capability. Mao Zedong thought that a nuclear war for the sake of a decisive victory over Western capitalism was quite permissible. At a meeting in the Kremlin, Palmiro Togliatti, leader of the Italian communists, anxiously asked the Chinese leader, but what will be left of Italy after such a war? Mao coldly replied, who says Italy should survive? 300 million Chinese will be left. That's quite enough for the human race to survive. Soviet leaders could not decide whether or not nuclear war could be waged. On November the 6th, 1949, Georgi Malenkov, the second Politburo member after Stalin, delivered a report on the anniversary of the October Revolution. He pointed out that the First World War had led to the emergence of the Soviet Union, the Second World War to the emergence of the whole coalition of socialist countries, and threatened, if imperialists launch a Third World War, that war will become a grave, not for individual capitalist states, but for world capitalism generally. Nikita Khrushchev spoke of using nuclear arms as something quite practicable. Later, his son said his father did not want the world to understand how weak he was. There was only one way to inspire, if not respect, then fear, to scare the West with the bomb. That is why Khrushchev bluffed by saying that he possessed more weapons than he actually had. When the Soviet leader received editors-in-chief from West German newspapers, one of them asked how many missiles it would take to annihilate their country. Khrushchev immediately called the general headquarters and, having heard the answer, put the phone down and contentedly said, just seven. At a New Year reception in the Kremlin in late 1960, Khrushchev told the US ambassador that he had 50 nuclear bombs ready for France and 30 each for Britain and West Germany. The Soviet leader was mocking, but who would take that as a joke? It was only in the early 1970s that the two superpowers that had equally feared nuclear war were able to find the possibility of a rapprochement. President Nixon had led the US towards the détente that his Soviet counterpart, Leonid Brezhnev, also desired. Stability and the prevention of nuclear conflict turned out to be more important than ideological differences, because the world truly feared that humanity would not survive nuclear warfare. We will look more at this turning point in public opinion in part two. This is the official channel of the International Luxembourg Forum on Preventing Nuclear Catastrophe, with a three-part documentary, Why Do We Not Fear Nuclear War? Please watch and subscribe.